Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining this Changing Plans seminar, which is hosted by the Grantham Institute at Imperial and run by myself, Patrick, uh, Ariana, Anna, and Ben, who are PhD students with the Science of Solutions for a Change in Planet DTP. Uh, stay up to date with our latest events, join our mailing list uh, to receive new newsletters and follow up on social media. Uh, we're currently in, in Imperial Sustainability Week, so there's uh, a few events going on, so do make sure to go to a few of them. Um, and just a before we start the seminar, a few housekeeping rules um, they need to be aware of. So before I introduce our speaker for today, um, this session is going to be recorded. And if you're attending the line, please ensure that your microphone remains on mute for the duration of the talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat and you will have an opportunity to ask your question at the cinema, seminar. Uh, please do include your name and affiliation as we'd love to see where you've joined us from. Um, so that being said, I'm Patrick. I'll be chairing the seminar for today. And it's the latest in our theme of translating research into policy, informing outcomes, implementing actions. <laughs> Bringing you seminars that highlight the role of science and decision making process in the implementation of proposed policy and the monitoring of progress towards goals. This, of course, this is of course of special importance with COP26 having um, happened in November last year and the CBD uh, convening for COP16 in coming, coming this year. Uh, so that being said, I'm delighted to welcome Chris Boyer uh, here, uh, who is a senior research fellow in the Faculty of Science and Health and the Faculty of Creative and Cultural Industries at the University of Portsmouth and deputy lead for the university's Revolution Plastics Initiative, driving interdisciplinary research and innovation to tackle the global plastics crisis. A biological scientist by training, I have previously worked in the arts. The primary purpose of our research is to address the global problems such as air quality, lung health and plastic pollution. Cresta currently works on a number of international projects using arts-based participatory methods, working in collaboration with community members to co-design and co-develop interventions with the aim of ensuring social and cultural relevance and ultimately increase impact. Cresta's talk today will address plastics, climate, and the art of making change. So that being said, over to you and welcome. I'm going to need this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Thank you. Thanks, Patrick, for that introduction. Okay, so thanks for the kind invitation to the Changing Planet seminar series. I'm Cressida, I'm from the University of Portsmouth, where I work as a senior research fellow, um, and I'm also di deputy director of Revolution Plastics. Next slide, please. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about Revolution Plastics, Revolution Plastics is a cross-university initiative which encompasses anything that's going on to do with research around plastics. So we um, have a centre for enzyme innovation, which is looking at biodegradation of plastics. We do some work on sustainable fashion and textiles. We do quite a lot of participatory work with communities in the Global South and also um, in our own city of Portsmouth. And we've recently launched the Global Plastics Policy Centre. Uh, Global Plastics Policy Centre was launched during COP26. And we recently analysed 100 policies, both governmental, industry, different initiatives. Um, and we provided a policy analysis framework in order to support sustainable transitions in practice and policy to reduce plastic waste. Um, and we'll have a website coming soon. So please do get in touch if you'd like to have access to that website. So today I'll be discussing plastics and climate change, how they're linked. I'll tell you a little bit about the very recently agreed resolution for a global plastics policy treaty. And I'd also like to share with you some of the research I've been doing in the Global South using creative methods and arts-based approaches um, for global challenges. So we all know the plastic is cheap, versatile and durable, and it's used in almost every aspect of our lives. 99% of plastic is made of fossil fuel. And this isn't a fact that is common knowledge. The global production of plastic is currently 380 million tonnes per annum. 
50% of this is single use plastics and only 9% is recycled. So only 9% of the plastic that we produce and consume is recycled. Plastic can take hundreds of years to decompose. And it, we now know that plastic degrades into tiny fragments called microplastics. And we're finding microplastics everywhere. They're ubiquitous. They're present in every environmental component and compartment that we've looked at. So... How does plastic contrib contribute to climate change? It contributes from cradle to grave at every stage of its life cycle. Production, consumption and disposal of plastic all have negative impacts on the environment. Plastic is actually responsible for 4% of total greenhouse gas emissions currently. And this is a significant contributor to global warming. That figure of 4% is probably higher because we don't currently account for the unregulated disposal of plastic waste and the informal burning that takes place. So, as I mentioned, 90% of plastic we consume is not recycled. About 40% goes to landfill. About 25% goes to formal incineration, and about 20% is dumped on the land. And quite a good proportion of that dumped plastic is actually burnt in the environment. It, it may be that there are quite good reasons to burn plastic waste. It does help to reduce the volume of plastic, and it may help to stop plastic becoming a reservoir for um, mosquitoes and um, bacteria that can transmit disease. Unfortunately, this open burning of plastic releases not only greenhouse gases, but a number of toxic gases such as dioxins and furans that are known to cause cancer. About 11 million tonnes of plastic escapes into the ocean every year. Plastic litter on land and sea has multiple impacts on ecosystem health and climate resilience, both of ecosystems and human communities. For instance, the ocean currently acts as a massive heat sink and carbon sink, absorbing approximately 25% of the carbon dioxide that's released into our atmosphere every year. Likewise with soil that, and land, trees um, and plants, that also absorbs approximately 25% of carbon dioxide that's released into the atmosphere. The presence of plastic exacerbates flooding. The flooding then causes transmission of plastic into the ocean, the presence of plastic in soil interferes with agriculture, with farming practices, um, and therefore with food security and economic livelihoods. And the impacts of this are particularly keenly felt, felt in the global south. We currently, the global north currently export quite a lot of our plastic waste to the global south for disposal because we don't have adequate infrastructure ourselves to recycle it, but we're exporting it to countries who have even less um, capabilities to recycle the plastic waste. So in short, plastic waste is making the impact of climate change worse, and therefore plastic action equals climate action. So what's currently being done at the highest level to deal with this problem of plastic pollution? A recent United Nations Environment Assembly meeting um, in February, during which 173 countries agreed a resolution to negotiate a global treaty to end plastic pollution. UNEA is the highest decision-making body in the world, and member states discuss and adopt policies to take action 
on environmental um, catastrophes. And the Global Plastics Treaty has the potential to become a game changer. Um, and this is a quote here from Inga Anderson, who's the executive director of UNEP. So I'll leave you to read that yourselves. So what actually has been agreed, the wording and the resolution is strong. The wording is a global treaty to end plastic pollution. The resolution applies across the whole of the plastic life cycle and includes marine and land-based litter. The definition of plastics also includes microplastics. All these factors make the resolution stronger than it was initially thought that it might be. So these are really positive steps that are going on. It's likely to focus on upstream solutions and systemic change, take into account things like sustainable design and plastic alternatives. Um, and it also recognises the need for some levelling up between developing and more developed countries. There's also an emphasis in the resolution on stakeholder engagement. So that's stakeholders, industry, producers, um, disposal routes, governments, but also the public and civ civic society. And the inclusion of these kind of diverse voices in negotiations is really important if we're going to have a holistic solution. Um, most people probably noticed that during COP26, some of the most powerful voices were from individuals who just stood up and gave quite um, empowering speeches. And a lot of those individuals were um, indigenous residents of invited countries. So what are the main obstacles? I mean, it's huge. It's going to require a momentous shift in our relationship with plastic. So are we ready for this? Are the fossil fuel industry ready for this? So negotiations will happen over the next two years. Um, and how, how, how will the treaty be implemented? I mean, there will be um, sanctions, both legal and financial, that will be available um, as penalties for countries who aren't um, abiding by the legally binding elements of the global treaty. However, it's quite unusual for these sanctions to be enforced. What's more typical is that um, help and support will be offered to the countries who may be struggling to reach the targets. And we're very proud that UNEP has enlisted the help of the university's Global Plastics Policy Centre to um, inform the negotiations progress. We'll be providing evidence-based analysis and evidence to the UNEP to help inform how the treaty progresses. So you've just heard that there's an imperative for both stakeholder engagement and um, sensitization of the public to the issues around plastic waste. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we've been using arts-based methods in the Global South to engage and involve the community in research. This is something called community-based participatory research, which basically means research that happens in the community, with the community and for the community and uh, allows access to an enormous amount of local knowledge um, and social capital, which is really important if we're going to come up with realistic, workable and impactful solutions to problems. Um, and we use a number of different creative methods during our research and dissemination. Um, and we'll come back to this puppet in a few slides. So the setting and the context in which we've been carrying out this research. We've been working in two locations. One is the informal settlement of Makuru in Nairobi, Kenya, 
and the other is Silet in Bangladesh. Bakuru is a huge urban slum with more than 150,000 families living in very cramped conditions. They live in tin shacks with earth floors. There is no running water um, and there is very limited access to electricity. So something like 25 families typically share one toilet and the toilets aren't always open. They tend to close uh, when it gets dark. So life's pretty tough. And you can see here in this picture that the presence of plastic in these communities is it's, it's kind of integrated into the, into the landscape really. And it's become completely normal for the people who live in those communities to experience plastic litter at this kind of level. And it, you know, you can see there that it's blocking up the drainage channels, which are pretty um, basic anyway, these drainage channels. So the last thing you need is for them getting blocked up with plastic. Silet is um, known as Bangladesh's second city, second in importance rather than in size. Again, Silet suffers a huge problem of plastic waste that's just discarded into the environment. There are very few formal waste management and waste collection systems happening in Select City. Um, but we're very lucky. We've been working with the mayor of Select and the local city council to um, devise some solutions to the problems of waste in the city. So the kind of research structure we use it's really important right from the start to get community buy-in and community participation. So this requires us to start consultations and um, democratic relationships really early on in the research process. We we'd like to work with people who are trusted voices in the community and um, it's useful to identify some community champions who can work more closely with the uh, researchers and become part of the team. Um, importantly, I think we pay people for the, their participation in the project and we hand over quite a lot of the power as well. So it's quite, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it was interesting during lockdown actually, because we were sort of forced to decolonize the process even more than we would normally do. So my involvement um, in using both creative methods and working in Nairobi um, started with something called the AIR Network, the Action for Interdisciplinary Research Network. This was funded by the um, MRC and the AHRC, and we were funded to go and work in Kenya, in Makuru, to try and identify what kind of creative methods would be useful when working with the community to tackle the issues around air pollution. So um, UK, European and African ac academics joined practitioners and community representatives in Kenya. And we spent a couple of weeks doing some pretty intense workshopping where we looked at a whole range of different communication methods, including theater, visual arts, storytelling and music. Um, and we started building this very close relationship with our um, community champions in Makuru. The um, project that first came out of the Air Network, which is still ongoing, is called Tupamui, which means let's breathe in Swahili. Um, and in this project, we're looking at non-communicable lung disease in Kenya and we're comparing the lung health of two populations of children aged 5 to 18. Kids who live in the slum, Makuru, and kids who live in an adjacent, more well-to-do settlement called Buru Buru. Um, we are researching the lived experience of those children in terms of air pollution. So to do that, we've been doing some walking and talking interviews. We've been monitoring the air pollution frequency, um, as we do those interviews to identify potential hotspots. But we've also been using visual arts to interrogate how people feel about their, where they live and how they feel about their lungs and their own lung health and their own experiences, day-to-day -day experiences of air pollution. 
Another one of the ways that we use creative methods in this project was um, to demystify the process of data collection. So to collect the lung health data, we, we carried out spirometry tests on more than 2,000 children. Um, and those tests, as you probably know, involve blowing into a spirometer, which assesses the um, volume of your lungs. So we devised with the community, with our community champions, we devised a puppet show, which basically spelled out step by step what the process of data collection would involve. Um, and we toured this puppet show around the schools where we were recruiting the children from. And it just worked absolutely fantastically because the kids, you know, it was super engaging. It also explained the project really, really well. You don't need to be able to read very well to understand what's going on in the puppet show. Um, and sometimes puppets can behave in a way that an actor or um, a communicator wouldn't be able to. Um, and yeah, actually, we've, had, we've just finished the data collection and we had a massive success with recruitment. Um, and we managed to recruit over 2,000 children to participate in the study, as I mentioned. Um, the second project that I started working on is called the STEP project, Sustainable Transitions to End Plastic Pollution. And in the STEP project, we are investigating community-driven solutions to the issues of plastic waste in the environment. So we've done some qualitative and quantitative research um, using local organisations to assess knowledge, attitudes and behaviours toward plastic waste. Um, we've done some research with a small scale recycling enterprise in Makuru and um, we've developed a business case with them and we've actually now got the first household level plastic waste collection in Makuru is happening as a result of this project. We've also um, created, well, we, we, I say we, we facilitated our community partners to create a whole range of sensitization outputs around the issues of plastic. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a couple of slides. However, short, um, shortly after we started um, to Pamui, and before we started the STEP project, COVID happened. So we de decided that we would divert some of our funding and some of our time into a project called ACT, Action Against COVID Transmission in Nairobi. Um, and this, of course, was delivered totally remotely with our um, community champions. Um, and we developed a whole range of sensitization outputs which explained why it is important to follow what was then the um, Kenyan government guidance around social distancing, hand washing and face mask wearing. Um, and we also, um, my colleague, Dr. Louis Netta, who's a, a visual artist, worked with some local artists in Makuru to produce a comic book, the ACT comic book, and that was really interesting because we discovered that a lot of the issues around um, COVID in the community were actually to do with things like um, police brutality um, and people being um, excluded because they were thought to have COVID infections. Um, so we uncovered some findings that we weren't expecting to see in that project. So talk a little bit about the methods that we use. So one of the methods that we use is um, music and video. Um, we discovered as part of the Air Network, when we went to Makuru, we discovered that music videos are, are, are not uncommonly used to sensitize the community on public health messages. So for instance, there's an incredible music video around cholera prevention. Um, so we were introduced to local musicians um, and actually sometimes it was our champions who became musicians who hadn't had experience of being musicians before. 
Um, and we have developed a number of videos that explain, so for the app project, they explained why you need to wear a mask, why it's good to do hand washing. Um, and for the step project, this video promotes recycling and reuse of plastics. Um, I presume the presentation will be shared at some point. So, uh, it can be. Yeah, can be so people can, you can, you'll be able to click on the links and um, have a look at the, um, those videos. One of the other methods we've used pretty successfully is theatre. So uh, on the picture on the left, is it your right? Um, you can see a play that was devised as part of the Air Network. This was about sources of air pollution. And my colleague, Dr. Sarah West from the Stockholm Environment Institute is there. She's being a cook stove um, in somebody's home. And uh, the two people are arguing about who's responsible for the fumes that are coming out of the cook stove. Um, and the other slide shows a plastic monster that we created to take up to COP26. So we were invited to participate in um, the Green Zone exhibition space as part of the COP26 Universities Network. Uh, and we took this monster up and the site we were given was quite a small kind of boring enclosed um, stand. But because we had this monster with us, we were able to roam across the whole of the Green Zone space and uh, attracted quite a lot of attention and it became quite a talking point for um, COP26 and we were basically we were there to draw attention to the links between plastics and climate. Next slide please. At the same time as the plastic monster was roaming the green zone in Glasgow at COP26, we also had a plastic monster in Bangladesh and a plastic monster in Nairobi. And if we can, I'd just like to play the G2 Lataka video because it'll give you um, a really good idea of how these things work in the community. We do care. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, and music's quite interesting because you can kind of, so that piece of music that went alongside that footage was especially composed. Um, and music's really interesting because it's got a wide reach and you can reach groups that would, might otherwise be quite hard to reach, like teenage boys. <laughs> um, another one of the methods we use is cell filming, which is basically where um, community members use their phones. Um, we usually manage to secure some funding for airtime um, as part of the project to enable them to make these short films. Um, and again, I, have we got time to yeah. have a look at this video diary? So there you can see in Long River, you know, the real, what I was referring to, you know, where the presence of plastic, the totally abnormal presence of plastic has become normalized in these communities. Um, the real issue is that there aren't any alternatives. There, there aren't any bins. There isn't any plastic waste, any formal plastic waste disposal. Um, as I mentioned, we've just started a household um, level plastic waste collection in McCrew. Um, 
So fingers crossed that will start to have some kind of impact on the amount of pollution in the environment. Um, on the other slide, you can see an artist called Ngugi Wareru from Waduka Arts in Makuru. Um, he's created a beautiful map of Makuru, which was then taken out into the community. And um, people who were just passing by were invited to come and identify pollution hotspots on the map. Um, and also talk about those hotspots. And that it kind of provides an opening into a bigger conversation. This project was actually about air pollution rather than plastic pollution, although, of course, they're um, inextricably linked through burning of plastic waste. Um, but again, you get a, an idea of how we can combine arts-based research and um, quite solid quantitative and qualitative data collection. Visual arts, another one of the methodologies we used. You can see here a mural that was painted to, um, uh, for messaging about face mask wearing during COVID. Um, and in the other picture, there's one of the pictures from the Tupamiri project of where kids are discussing their um, lung health um, according to some drawings that they produced earlier. So in conclusion, using these methodologies, it really does help to engage and empower local communities. And uh, it is also really fun. It's really lively. It's culturally appropriate and it's led by community champions. Um, it kind of disrupts the hierarchies that can exist sometimes between academics and communities. Um, we've had a few people say to us, you know, not, often um, researchers will come in because they know that they need to consult the community on the issue that they're researching and they'll get their forms filled out and then they'll go away again. Um, we've been to um, Makuru six times in total now and done quite a lot of work in the community. So we're kind of known um, and we work with trusted voices. So we're ourselves becoming more trusted voices in that community. Um, and some of these creative messages, you can reach a really wide audience and you can reach a wide range of um, community members as well. So if you've got a mural on a, on a busy market corner, a lot of people are gonna see it, a lot of people are gonna talk about it. Or if you've got a song that's on the radio or on the TV, obviously that's gonna reach a lot of people that way as well. So I just wanted to um, show you a video um, from the Tupamui project. And this video basically showcases a lot of the methods that I've just been talking about. So, uh, yeah, you'll see the puppet. How are we going for time? I've gone too quickly. 20 minutes left. Yeah. Oh, so I've taken 40. Yeah. yeah, that's what she said. Yeah. I'm 
So Pumua Fiti, Ishi Fiti means um, live well, breathe well. Um, and I think you can get some sense from that video of the kind of community buy-in, the community involvement that that project now has. And, you know, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that almost everybody in Makuru now knows about the project of Pumui. Um, but, you know, as part of that dissemination, we've also raised quite a lot of awareness about lung health and about some of the causes of lung disease and how you can avoid some of the causes of lung disease. Um, and there's a huge um, appetite in, the, in, in that community. They're very excited to hear the results of the study and also to get a little bit more data about what they can do to protect their own and their, and their children's lungs as they're growing up. So, final slide, please. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks to all our collaborators and participants and funders and especially our community members. Um, that's just a few of our, the funders from the projects that I've just shown actually on the slide. Um, and please get in touch if you want to find out anything more about the projects, about Pla Revolution Plastics or about the Global Plastics Policy Centre. Um, I've included three different email addresses there, but you, you can use any one of them to get in touch with the others. Um, so yeah, thanks very much and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was great. Thank um, you. So do you have any, I know we've got a couple online, but do we have any questions here in person? Okay, well, I think so. I will pass it over to uh, Hannah. Uh, are you able to unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, yes, you can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, considering that UNEP's headquarters is based in Nairobi, I was wondering how it's possible that they've not already been working with the government and the community to address this situation. Um, well, I don't think it's quite true to say that they haven't been working with the government. Um, I, we actually were hoping to um, showcase some of our project methods at UNEA, but we realised it wasn't the right space to do that. Um, but we certainly do intend to do that in the, in the coming two years. I mean, UNEP and UNEA, they're pretty good on creative methods of sensitization, actually. I don't know if anybody saw the great big tap sculpture that was outside the negotiations, um, created by an artist called Ben Von Wong. Um, and that was um, made using plastics, I think, that had been gathered from, 
think it might have been one of the slums in Nairobi, actually. Um, I'm not quite sure. So, but yes, it's interesting that um, UN Habitat is sited right in the middle of Nairobi. So any, any negotiators who even just had to drive through the streets of Nairobi will have seen the amount of plastic waste that's just dumped in that environment. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I now kind of have another question in the chat, but we'll go to uh, Ra Yu Yuya uh, first, if you would unmute yourself and ask the question. Not sure. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you. Okay, I'll speak up. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, a lot of developed countries um, claim to recycle their plastic by basically burning them and transform that into energy. Um, I was wondering if um, if there's not a potential in expanding that sector in these affected areas of, in the global south, if they already have all the waste exported to them, might as well transform it to like something useful and less polluting. Yes, yeah, so I think there are a number of issues around that. I think for effective, efficient burning of plastic waste, so even really sophisticated incineration plants release some greenhouse gases and some toxic gases into the environment. Um, and there's also a, an ash product, which is fairly toxic, that um, also has to be disposed of too. Um, and of course, we all appreciate that ultimately the solution has to be about producing less plastic and not just recycling more plastic. Um, uh, so there's a financial um, difficulty about establishing those kind of um, energy generating plants in um, countries in the global south. Um, there are also issues around enforcing regulations. So, you know, whilst we might appreciate that in the Netherlands, um, the rules and regulations around incineration are really strict, and I should imagine them, you know, it's all quite well regulated. Um, in a country like Kenya or Bangladesh, um, the rules probably wouldn't be so stringent, and they may not be enforced to the same degree that they are um, in other countries. Um, I think we also have to remember that we are responsible in the global north for a lot of the plastic that gets shipped out to those countries who can't deal with it. Um, so yeah, we need to manage our own waste better. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And back to Hannah, if you wanna ask your second question. Sure, thanks. Um, and apologies if I missed this, but I was wondering if most of the waste is coming from the individuals that are living there or if it's coming from somewhere else. And then an unrelated question is how, how you're measuring the impact of your work, the work that you're doing there. Yeah, so in terms of the plastic waste, where it originates from, a lot of the plastic waste does originate from within the community and within the environment. Um, but according to the results of, and, and as I mentioned before, you know, it's, there aren't bins, there aren't really alternatives. It's the norm to just dispose of your trash. So what tends to happen in Makuru is there's a kind of informal household level waste collection system where people pay a small fee to some um, youth to come and collect their waste. That waste then just gets taken and dumped by the river. Um, so, yeah, it, because there aren't any alternatives. Um, however, according to the results of some brand audits that have been carried out in um, informal settlements in many countries, actually, we can track the origin of, of a lot of these plastics to the UK, the US um, and Europe. So yeah, it's not only um, internally generated, but yes, quite a lot of it is. Um, there, are, there are interesting issues around things like sachets and um, small milk, plastic sachets of milk, 
um, people live a very day-to-day -day existence and um, people can afford to buy the shampoo for the week for that for that for the one hair wash in a sachet um, when they can't afford to buy a whole bottle of shampoo likewise with the milk you kind of buy the milk for the day rather than the milk for a few days especially given there's no refrigeration um, in most of the households yes yeah, sorry that was the second question wasn't it um, yeah, so in, impact evaluation. So for the Tupamui project and for the STEP project, we've actually um, provided some um, knowledge sharing um, workshops. We've run some knowledge sharing work workshops with our champions and we have provided some training in impact evaluation actually. Um, and we are in the process of doing that impact evaluation for the Tupamuri project. Otherwise, we've really got, we've only got anecdotal evidence so far. So for instance, you know, the fact that so many people um, in that environment know about the project. Um, so one of the impact evaluators is the fact that we very successfully recruited the full cohort of children and that almost all of the children who turned up to have the spirometry had seen the puppet show and um, you know, had learned about the data collection process through the, sh through the show. But yes, I agree, it's a really important thing to do and it's oft necessary to do that outside of the funding window, actually. It's quite frustrating <laughs> that you end up, you know, the, the, the project's closed and you still haven't had time to do the impact evaluation. Um, but yes, we're, we're very aware of the importance of that, hence providing the training to our community champions. Brilliant, thank you very much. And we have another question from Del Olsen on the chat, if they'd like to unmute themselves. Sure. Hello. Thank you so much, Cresta. That was such an interesting talk. That was great. Um, I just had a couple of questions, which I think you've sort of started to answer, really. The first was about how, I mean, I was really struck by the fact that you're talking about the conversations that the artwork and the art practice generate. And I was wondering how, how, how it works in relation to the conversations then becoming part of the data, or could you speak a bit more about the ways in which that those conversations that the artwork generates become quantitative, qualitative data? Um, and then I suppose my second point or question really was about um, how the the the, the plastics are in a way that the, the sort of outcomes of the research how are they turned back onto the companies? And you mentioned the UK, but how do we? Um, how are we confronted with that? Or is, is that another stage of the project? But fa a really fascinating work, thank you. Thank you, thanks. Yes, so with the data collection using the visual arts methodology, so for instance, in the Tupamui project, um, we did some classroom activities around drawing your lungs, drawing your body, identifying areas of your body where you felt that air pollution impacts your health, um, asking people to draw their everyday experiences of air pollution, what they think the main sources of air pollution are. So, you, you, and then you can do a pretty straightforward thematic analysis on that. So you can look at the frequency of something like smoking or cook stoves or industrial emissions or, you know, vehicle emissions. These are typical examples, dust um, from, the, from the roads. Um, and then, so then you can start to look at the frequency of those elements um, with which they occur in the kids' drawings. Um, but also, as you say, they become a kind of conversation opener. So there are conversations that happen around those drawings, which again, you can do some recording and thematic analysis on those conversations. Now, one of the things that we've done in the Tupamui project actually is we've handed the results of the analysis back to the children, some of the children who took part in the exercise, to just check in with the community again that we haven't misinterpreted what, were, what was being said um, when those drawings were being done. So it's quite surprising sometimes, you know, that something can be quite easily misinterpreted. So for instance, with the air network, 
um, one of the main causes of air pollution that was identified was the bad smell that comes up from the sewers. And we, as academics working in the air pollution space, would not traditionally, you know, that wouldn't be a category of air pollution. But in fact, in that community, it was a hugely important source of air pollution. So we had to revise our um, sort of parameters, if you like, um, and, and look at the you know, whole definition of air pollution again. In terms of um, reporting the outcomes back to industry, I, yeah, that's a, really, <laughs> that's a really interesting question. I mean, obviously, it's going to be incredibly important in the next two years when we're working towards this global treaty agreement to have open dialogue with industry. You know, the fossil fuel industry, you know, they're being hit in terms of, you know, we're turning much towards renewable sources of energy, um, electric powered cars. Um, so that well, as that's going on, a lot of the fossil fuel players are turning their sights towards the plastics industry um, as a potential new market. Um, and particularly in countries like Africa and India. Um, so that's going to be an interesting challenge to um, kind of get the, get the participation of the big industries, the big players, the Coca-Colas, Pepsi, Unilever, Procter & Gamble. But, you know, you, you could argue that it's super important to, the, to have those voices at the negotiation table if you're going to um, develop viable um, solutions. Uh, it, yeah, it's interesting at the moment, isn't it, with the you know, with the situation in the Ukraine and oil has suddenly become this massively important thing. Again, you realise what a, you know, huge sort of thick strand it is that runs through the global economy. Um, but yeah, it's a bit like with climate change, you know, the kind of huge systemic shifts that we're going to have to make if we're going to address any of these global crises in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, otherwise, as we know, we're not going to address them. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Um, we have a question from Sarah who cannot unmute themselves. So uh, they would like to ask, would the provision of waste collection and management infrastructure provide more benefits to communities given the barriers you've mentioned? Well, yes, it is possible to, um, if you, you know, plastic waste does have a value. It does have a small monetary value in terms of being able to sell it as a material for recycling. Um, that monetary value really increases if the plastic is sorted, segregated and washed at source so that you're selling either PET or, you know, high density plastics or low density plastics, you're separating them out. They immediately become, they hold more value per kilo, if you like. Um, so it is about sort of integrating a system where the value of waste is recognized, um, but also the supply chains and the infrastructure for that um, it's made a bit more workable and we're actually involved in projects looking at that at the moment in both um, Nairobi, Kenya, but also in um, an, a place called Lamu in Kenya, which is um, an island and archipelago just above Mombasa on the coast. Um, and they suffer an enor enormous amount of plastic waste um, in the ocean, on the beaches and particularly in the mangroves. So the mangrove roots kind of trap all this plastic. So at the moment we're investigating the economic feasibility of removing the plastics from the mangroves, um, taking them to a collection center, segregating, washing, actually shredding and extruding on site into useful products so those include things like fence posts and building bricks, but more excitingly, and some of you might be aware of something called the flip floppy, which is um, a traditional um, Kenyan fishing boat made totally out of recycled plastic. 
um, and we are hoping to establish a training centre on Lamu Island um, to start some apprenticeships on how people can use environmental plastic waste as a feedstock for making um, fishing boats. Uh, and also then, then you're kind of preventing people from cutting trees down to make those fishing boats as well. So it's a bit of a double good thing there. So but basically in short, it's about recognizing the value of the plastic um, to um, you know, remediate it from the environment, but also to, to stop it getting there in the first place. So you know, as it comes out of the household, it needs to be diverted into proper recycling. Um, but still, having said that, recycling is not the full answer to the um, issues around our consumption of plastic. Brilliant. Uh, I think that's a, unless we've got any more questions ahead, that's a good point to leave at. <laughs> and you've got to five. Uh, thank you very much again, thank uh, you. Priscilla. A uh, really great talk. And I uh, would just like to say, uh, we're, next week we have, we will have Sean Henley, who we discussing Antarctic marine ecosystems under pressure. Um, and we look forward to welcoming everyone here then as well. Um, and also, I mentioned before, it's uh, Imperial Sustainability Week. So please do make sure to check out the events and come along, yeah. Um, so yeah, final thank you very much, Professor. And uh, we'll leave it there for everybody. Cheers. Um, can thank you. All of the CP students, the ink particles we shared shortly. And then people can link to the events in the chat, but I won't pay for some reason, so. Hold on for a second, I think that there's